Sea urchins are essentially folded up sea stories. Very pokey folded up sea stories. Pokey enough that even I might consider putting on some shoes. Maybe. Today we're finishing our exploration of the hedgehog skinned echinoderms. We're talking sea urchins. Climbing up the tree of life one little group at a time. Most sea urchins look exactly like you would envision them. Round balls with spikes poking out on all sides. But some sea urchins look a little different. The sand dollars, for example, are flat sea urchins without spikes. And the pencil urchins have round blunted spikes that no one needs shoes to protect themselves from. But even the more typical round balls of spiky doom come in all colors and sizes. These balls of out are usually only a couple centimeters large, but they can range from a couple of millimeters to the size of a dinner plate. Like our other echinoderms, the sea urchins have ossicles, so these plates of armor under their skin. In the case of the sea urchins, they are fused to form a rigid shell or test. You've probably seen these shells in tourist shops because they are frequently sold as decorations there. If you look closely at a dead shell, you'll not only see the little bumps that the spikes attach to, but also why I call them folded up sea stars. Sea urchins have the same fivefold symmetry as sea stars. Yes, yes, I know, it's not as simple as that, but let's not get into that again. If I tell you that they move, you might expect them to move with those spines. And while those spines are mobile, it's usually not how they get along. I mean, sand dollars don't have spines, so they can't be their only way to move. Those spines can move kind of like your arm in your shoulder socket, but because there's just one joint, they don't make the best leg replacement. And yes, most sea urchins have two lengths of those spines, one longer and one shorter one, but that still doesn't get them anywhere. Instead, sea urchins have little holes at the bottom of their test where the tip feet, kind of like with the sea stars, can get through to help them move. To be fair, they sometimes do kind of use the spines to move, but it's usually in assistive capacities for the tube feet to work better or to right themselves after they were flipped over by a careless diver or storm. Fun fact, those tube feet also kind of function as eyes. They use the tube feet to perceive light and dark. And it gets even weirder when you know that we now think they use their entire body as a kind of eye. They have modified tube feet that kind of function like tentacles around their main mouth in addition. Wait, main mouth? Yes, main mouth, because they have a lot of tiny mouth called pedicellaria between their spikes, and each of those mini mouth has a movable jaw too. They also have a real mouth, usually at the center of the bottom. In some species, it's a structure called Aristotle's lantern, a combination of teeth or teeth bands, plates, and a soft tongue-like Thing. That main mouth can scrape, cut, bore, and is really effective at even drilling into rock. It's also what makes urchins so detrimental to kelp forests, but we'll get there. Behind that creepy lantern structure is an esophagus and then the intestine, which reaches all the way to, well, you guessed it, the anus. They also have a madreporite, like many of the sea stars, which is the inlet for that water system, which makes the water power tube feet work like suction cups. It's really impressive to me that they can control all these systems without a real brain, but we've established before that a lot is possible without one. What's with the brain donuts nature? Most sea urchins are broadcast spawners, but again, there are some that keep their eggs between their spines until they are ready to hatch. Broadcast spawning always sounds so simple. You just throw your sperm or your eggs into the water and hope for the best. But for that to be effective, there's usually some kind of synchronization. Often the moon is the synchronizing thing. So these brainless, eyeless things can still use moonlight to coordinate when to spawn. Impressive, right? It's probably why it's so detrimental to animals when humans turn the night into the day, especially in larger cities. How is an urchin supposed to tell the difference between a coastal city's light pollution and the light of the moon? But don't worry, we're not getting into light pollution today. We'll leave that depressing topic for another video. While the typical urchin is pokey enough that even my barefoot living feet shiver a little bit at the thought of them, the pencil urchins just look fucking 
cool. With fewer, thicker and dull spikes, it makes them look a lot less scary. While it would already be really hard to get that blunted spike into your foot, they are also not poisonous like most of the more typical urchins, so the hole in your foot would be your biggest worry. What I don't get is why the pencils of the pencil urchin are considered a souvenir by many tourists. Really, the things people will display in their living room or throw in a drawer of decoration nonsense always amaze me. It's usually the same people who complain about antlers displayed on a wall because that's just gross, but they have absolutely no scruples displaying half a dead ocean in their bathroom as decoration. Another example of a really cool urchin are the sand dollars, and they are pretty unique. While they are definitely technically sea urchins, they look little like them. Instead of balls with spikes, they are flat and spineless. Okay, technically they have tiny bristles, but those bristles feel more like fur or fabric than anything dangerous. Nothing compared to the pokey spikes of the more typical urchins. Remember how I told you that the sea urchins don't use their spines to move and use the sand dollar as an obvious example? Well, as always, things are a little more complicated. Because the sand dollars move into the sand and on the sand so much, they get much better traction with those tiny bristles, which are technically their spines, than with their teeny tiny tube feetsies. Between those firm bristles that are technically the spines, there's even tinier bristles called cilia. Those cilia are kind of like eyelashes and move food particles toward the mouth. They too have that lantern thing which allows them to chomp down. They might not look much like urchins, but if you take a close look at one of the living specimens, or a quick look even at one of the dead ones, you'll see that same sea star pattern in the middle that you also find in the other echinoderms. Speaking of dead things, the tests of the sand dollars, independent of the species, are also a popular souvenir that people display without even thinking about it being a dead thing. And with that, we'll move on to one urchin I've seen way too many of, though I'm still very fascinated by them. When we dived around the Channel Islands near Los Angeles, we would see entire kelp forests munched up by these urchins. As I said earlier, those lantern structures are damn fucking good at destruction. Their aggressive feeding behaviors allow them to turn the kelp forest and ecosystem wonderland into an urchin barren. And those urchin barrens have become really prominent all over over the globe. Sea urchins, mostly due to their spines, don't have many non-human predators, just not worth the hassle. Sure, some animals eat them and so do humans, but thanks to the added stressors of the climate crisis like warming oceans and habitat loss of their predators, sea urchins are taking over some of the most beautiful ecosystems. The heroes in the fight against the urchins are the otters. If you've ever watched a video of a keystone species, you've probably probably heard about the interactions of otters, urchin and kelp before. And yes, obviously my keystone species video has the same example. But the short version is sea otters have figured out how to crack the urchin without poking their little fingers on the spines. And a dead urchin can't eat kelp. Another predator, the sunflower star, was the star of our sea star episode. Yes, yes, pun intended, I know. Anyway, the sea star wasting syndrome was detrimental to the sun star population populations, taking a very big predator of the urchins away. There are more and more urchins spreading all through the Pacific Northwest. Researchers tried to find out why, and they found that the otters weren't going for the barrens. They kept eating the ones in the intact ecosystems. And my first romantic thought was that they just wanted to keep the balance in the intact ecosystems and didn't want to waste their efforts on the barrens, but the truth naturally is much simpler. The urchins in the intact ecosystems are nutrient rich and have big gonads that the otters like to munch on, while the ones in the barrens are slowly starving away and just not worth the hassle. No matter why the otters protect the intact ecosystems, the fact is they do and they help keep the remaining last patches of beautiful kelp forest as much in balance and intact as possible. And in a way they are also benefiting the barrens, because once the urchins are starving they can't feed anymore and they die 
and spores from the healthy kelp forests move on to the barrens, repopulating the areas. Now we just need to protect the otters, mitigate the effects of climate change and stop destroying this planet to give the ecosystems a chance to recover. Nature is helping the otters as much as nature can, so why aren't we? 